Uh, let's jump off with a word of prayer and then we're, we're going to dig in deep. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word and the chance to study it. And uh, we're grateful as always, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that uh, guides us and directs us as we um, seek to rightly divide the word of truth. And we know how important that is. And um, we're grateful that you've privileged us with this knowledge. And uh, God, we're um, as always too, we're grateful for your death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus. We know that it is by your work alone that we are saved. And so we trust in you. Uh, God, I thank you for this uh, fellowship of believers that's gathered together today, Lord, to study. And I uh, pray, as always, that you uh, lend your aid. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Romans. Y'all come to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We are, y'all, we're going to get all the way into 11. I know, Emma. Like, I'm, I'm breaking speed records, right? Um, Romans chapter 10. And this is, you know, it's funny because this section of Romans, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, historically, like, they're, it's battleground territory. But for me, it's actually, to me, the simplest part of the whole book of Romans. <laughs> and I don't know, I mean, it's, it, there's not really, to me, a whole lot of debate, but it, it certainly elicits that from a lot of people. Um, all right, let's start here. Romans 10, uh, let's kind of pick up where we left off last week. Romans 10, 9, let's start there. Um, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right. For years. I feel pretty confident in saying this because I, I, I know most of you pretty well. We have been told that these verses command us. They command us to make Jesus Lord of our lives. Beginning with making some kind of public, verbal confession. Am I right? Now, I don't know everybody here, Julie. I'm just getting to know you, all right? And, and some of you in here, Kaylin too. And Here's the thing. I came up through the Baptist ranks, right? And I can tell you this. In fact, when I was in seminary, uh, one of the things we had to do for our evangelism classes, they, they gave us, we had to buy these evangelism books and there were different strategies and approaches to sharing the gospel. One in particular that I remember that just makes me want to puke now when I think about it was called the net. And it's all about casting your net and drawing in people and getting them saved. We had to memorize the whole book. And I'm not kidding you. It was as thick as this notebook. And the whole idea was to bring somebody to this place where they're willing now to turn over their life to Jesus, let Him be on the throne of their life and be the Lord. Now we, we are wrangling in things and, and we're straightening up for Jesus now to save us. How does that sound to y'all? Does it sound like grace? <laughs> it does not um, at all. And so because you know why? It's not grace. And, and uh, I'm going to be very frank here, it's not even biblical. That verse has nothing to do with making Jesus Lord of your life. In fact, you'll notice in those verses we just read, not one time did you even read a command. So where is this stuff coming from? Well... Glad you asked, because <laughs> I have the answer for you. Um, as you're going to see, obviously, this is not only unbiblical, but it's just flat out wrong. Most of the time, preachers uh, who are making this argument, when they come to Romans chapter 10, especially verses 9 and 10, they will, they will couple these verses with other passages of Scripture. And in doing so, they're being biblical. They're using the Bible to make a point 
that you need to make Jesus Lord of your life. Now, what are these other verses? Where are they? Where do they come from? Now, hold your marker here in Romans 10. Let's, let's go down this Baptist road. This is the old-time religion. Are you all ready? So, We're going to pick up our cross. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, that's one of the stops along this route. Y'all come back first, though. Let's go to the one that just really wreaked havoc in my life, Matthew chapter 7. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7. We're going to make fun of the Baptists and the Baptists. No, not listen. Okay, and and hey, I'm glad you said that, Michael. So you be quiet. You are banished from talking for the rest of this hey, time. This morning. You morning. listen. Now, um, I was the. You know, Paul says he was the worst among and all this stuff. Listen, I ain't gonna lie to you. I was the most Baptist among the Baptists. Okay, so I stood in pulpits many a Sunday and commanded people to serve on missions and to teach and to give and get baptized and do all this stuff and confess Him as Lord. I've been there and I've done that. Let me tell you though, this is not an effort. And I need to say this to my YouTube audience, whoever's out there, maybe listen to this. In all sincerity, this is not a bash session. This is a correction session. We are commanded in Scripture to convince, rebuke, exhort. But listen to this. You ready, Michael? This is hard for you and me. With all long suffering, you don't like that. I now, you and I have suffered on the whole Well, I am rebuking you, Michael. So listen, <laughs> this is hard. So I am speaking from personal experience. In fact, this is. If y'all want me to, I'll kick into Baptist mode here in a minute, and I'll I'll offer an invitation if y'all want to, and y'all come down to the altar, and I'll pray with you, and we'll we'll pray over your you know toe fungus or whatever you may have, and we'll ask the Lord to save you. But so here's what happens: Romans ten nine that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And these preachers, boy, they're just bloviating. And they're trying to convince you, Michael, because obviously you are a sinner in need of salvation, but you're not ready yet until you're willing to make Him the Lord of your life. Now how might I come to this conclusion? Well, the Bible obviously states it. And who better to turn to than the Lord Himself? These red letters. And what do these red letters say in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, Caitlin, this sounds familiar, doesn't it? We got Baptist roots. I know. Mississippi Baptist roots. I've been there. I've been there. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, it's not just a mouth thing, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many wills. This is where the guilt part comes in now, alright? Because you may not quite be ready in the moment because you may not realize how terrible you are. But let me just tell you how terrible you are. You can be very religious, but according to Jesus right here, you really need to pay attention. He says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name uh, done many wonderful works and then I will profess unto them I never knew you depart from me ye that work iniquity and then they'll they'll go there's another stop along this road of, of guilt and shame to, to force you into this corner to where you say I need Jesus as the Lord of my life I'm ready to turn it over to him and so we go to Luke chapter 9 this is Michael's favorite passage and if he were a Baptist preacher, this is what he would use. <laughs> right, Michael? Uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Now, guys, this is biblical. It's there. You cannot deny that, okay? This is biblical information that I am giving you right now. And Jesus says in verse 23 there, And He said unto them all, If any man will come after me, you've got to do something. You've got to deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. That's making Him Lord. And then, oh, this one really tops it off. Let's just jump on over to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. (laughs) 
and maybe verse 24. We'll just cherry pick one here. <laughs> verse 24. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So hey, listen. If I'm a man of the Word, I've been called to preach and I have been called to invite sinners to be saved. I take up the sword and I say, listen, here's what the sword tells us. It cuts deep, boy. And I tell you, you're sitting there and you feel that cutting. It's getting you right down to the bone. I know you're feeling it. That's why this altar is open is so that you can find yourself here being obedient to the Word of God. This is biblical. You don't have to trust me. This is the Word of God, right? And then they say, Romans 10, 9 and 10, you've got to confess Him as Lord. And you've got to believe in your heart. It's not just about the belief, it's about the works too. In fact, your works will almost substantiate your faith. Unless you're doing this, this wasn't real. Y'all heard this before, right? And so, this is how the argument is built. Um, this is wrong. Now, let me ask this room. Why is that wrong? It's biblical. Where is the error in what I'm telling you? Let me start here. Cotton. Is what I'm telling you error? No. No, it's biblical. <laughs> but it's not meant for us. Ah, that's interesting. You're telling me. Let me make sure I'm hearing you right. I have the right to pick and choose what I listen to here? Yeah, tell me. I mean, Based on what? Well, this was uh, Jesus. This was while they were under the law. We're under grace. You're starting to sound like a cult leader now, Cotton. I don't know what you're. I don't know what you're talking about. We got visitors here. Now. I don't want them hearing this now. This sounds terrible coming out of your mouth, Cotton. I didn't know you were like this. Now, come on, help me. No, hey, Cotton, you're right. You're right. I got Cotton's nervous back there, y'all. He's just he's squiggling and squirming his head. I put him on the spot. Um, I need you as much as is possible right now to go back a little bit in your mind, in your heart. Remember when you first started hearing this. And if you were like me, we talked about this last week, didn't we, Caitlin? Just how you feel like somebody is taking you by the, not really even taking you by the, they're pushing you up to the edge of the cliff and says, if you don't jump, you die and go to hell. Now hold on, mom and daddy did not tell me this is the way to go. My, my grandma and grandpa didn't tell me this is the way to go. My aunt and uncle, the, the preacher has not told me this is the way. In fact, the preacher told me to get as far away from y'all as I can get. <laughs> you bunch of heathens, you know. Uh, something's up. Okay, so this is difficult. Unknowingly, what happens all the time Preachers in particular, they deny in their, in their preaching the Bible, they're actually denying the truth in the Bible. And what truth in particular am I talking about? Well, here's a good one. One that is so unoften spoken about, especially in seminaries, I can tell you this for a fact, that it is alarming 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing what? The word of, word of truth. truth. Now, 
We had this conversation about Truman a minute ago, Lee, so I've got to give credit where credit is due. Truman was the first to ever show me this, and I was sitting in his living room at his house one day when he showed me this. He said, Greg, he said, what do you think it means? He always asked me questions acting ignorant, but I knew he already knew the answer, and he was testing me, you know, and praise God for that. But he'd say, he'd say Greg, now, why, what do you think that means, dividing the word of truth? And I just, I finally got to the point, I just was dumb with Truman. I said, Truman, you're just going to tell me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and so he said, well, he said, all right, pick up that Bible. He always had a Bible sitting there next to this chair that I'd sit in. He said, pick up that Bible there. He said, all right. He said, now I want you to start in the front, and I want you to go to the back. And he said, I want you to tell me, where is the error in that book? And obviously, I was, well, it's, it's not there, Truman. There's no error there in the word of truth. And... He said, well, he said, the reason why I'm saying that, he said, because a lot of people think when we hear this phrase, rightly dividing the word of truth, because modern translations have twisted the meaning of these words, they, they take that to mean we are to separate truth from error. We are to correctly handle the word of truth, because that's how the modern translations render it. The problem with that thinking is there's no error to sift out. You're not rightly dividing truth from error. That's not what the Scripture says. You are rightly dividing the word of truth, which means you are making separation of truth from truth. That's what the Word teaches. To make straight, clean cuts. That's what the word uh, rightly dividing. Orthotomeo in the Greek, is, it means to make straight, clean cuts. Okay, You're to make clean cuts of the word of truth. So then the golden question just becomes at that point, well, where do you make the cuts? And that's where you've got to study. You've got to tune in. But there's no question we are to divide. Now what happens, and the, way, the reason we've gotten to these places where we've all been guilted into this lordship salvation stuff is because, by and large, preachers are not trained. They have no clue about. They've not even heard about this reality of rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, if you'll notice just a moment ago when I was running through these passages, Matthew chapter 7, Luke chapter 9, James chapter 2, every one of those passages, Cotton, you nailed it on the head, were from portions of Scripture that were pertaining to a different dispensation, a different policy system for a different people, a different time. Doesn't mean we don't need it, but... When it comes to the doctrines that we that order our existence and our being as the body of Christ today, those do not pertain to us. Does that make sense? Clear as mud. Michael. I'm being, I'm being nice. <laughs> um, also, you know, the real thing my pastors know that that verse means you divide the Old Testament from the New because there's a page in the Bible that tells you where to divide it, the word of truth. <laughs> yep. Now, and, and, and it's a great point. Most people, when they think division of Scripture, they think in terms of Old Testament and New Testament. The problem with that is, is number one, it's way too simplistic because there's many more divisions than that. Secondly, it's not even actually divided correctly, not according to the pages of Scripture, because a testament is not into, in, in effect until the death of the testator. Well, if that's the case, the Old Testament doesn't end until the end of the Gospels. Technically speaking, right? And so we've already got issues there. <laughs> um, and it doesn't begin until the law is given with Moses. And so what happens to all that stuff before then? What testament is that? You know, so we've got all kinds of issues in. And this is why it's important for us as students of the Word to make sure when we're studying to get down into the details, get down to the nitty gritty, and learn to pick up on those differences, those distinctions, the uniqueness from portion to portion of Scripture. Now, um, another reason why this lordship stuff is, is wrong, or it's, a, it's an improper interpretation of Romans 10, 9 through 13, is verse 14. Look, Come back with me to Romans 10, verse 14. And this is where we'll start moving forward today. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. The Apostle Paul writes this, How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, 
This is interesting to me. Notice the order here. That order is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul wasn't just willy-nilly throwing things out there. There is an order to that verse, and it's actually in reverse order in the way that someone experiences salvation. Okay? And so, notice the first thing that happens is somebody preaches, right? Then, somebody hears what's being preached, right? And even in that transaction, there are other things happening that aren't even visible, correct? The Holy Spirit's doing work and all kinds of things. What happens after they hear? Then what happens? Then they believe. Then what happens after they believe? <clears throat> they can call. All right, now here's my question. This is a big one. At which of those stages is a person justified? Let's read verse 14 again. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So again, you've got these stages. Preaching, hearing, believing, calling. Which of those stages, at which one of those stages is a person justified? At the point they've been preached at? At the point they've heard? At the point they've believed? Or at the point they've called? At which stage are they justified? When they believe. What makes you think that? Scripture tells us. Ah, where? First Corinthians 15. You don't even have to go that far. We're going to go there though, Emma. Go back just a few verses to verse 10. What does the first part of verse 10 say? For with the heart one believeth unto what? Now when we talk about being justified, that means being brought into alignment. What are we aligned with? His righteousness. So being justified is attaining righteousness. In fact, go with me to 2 Corinthians real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look with me at uh, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. For He hath made Him, God hath made Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made what? The righteousness of God in Him, in Christ. So what happens when you believe in the work of Christ? What happens? You are made the righteousness of God. Let me sum that up in one word. You are justified. Okay? Now... Are you saved at that moment? Saved in the sense we've always thought about being saved. Saved in the sense that we are now secure and we will get a home in heaven. What do y'all think? Julie, Julie, you're bold. Julie said, no. And then as soon as she said, I saw her, she kind of like pinched her lips like, maybe I shouldn't have said anything. He's going to call on me now. Why would you say no? Because you have to believe Jesus died, was buried, and rose. Okay. Nowhere there does it say, at least to us, mm -hmm. in my opinion, yeah. um, anything about Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection. Okay. All right. So my question is, though, at the moment you do believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay, we know at that moment we're justified, we're made the righteousness of God. At that moment, though, 
let's say we drop dead in, the, in that invisible thing that happens in that moment nothing physically has gone on it's just that all of a sudden in our heart it's like blink, click we believe <laughs> okay so that happens we're now justified if we died right then would we wake up in heaven would we be saved do y'all see the conundrum though because of verse 13 back there in, in Romans chapter 9 uh, or 10, excuse me. For whosoever shall what? Call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But this is where you got to keep reading. Verse 14 provides some very valuable commentary for us. Okay? And it makes a separation between believing and calling. Those are two separate stages. Okay? And this is also, I, I tell you all all the time, as people who are rightly dividing, every one of us in this room are students who are growing. We're growing in our understanding of this word. And right division is one of those things that helps us become more and more precise. We have got to learn, especially in this culture that we're in, this very religiously saturated culture, we have to learn to be very precise about how we explain these doctrines. Okay? Um, and so in that, we need to learn that there is a difference between calling on the Lord for salvation versus believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be justified. Because that word salvation or to be saved can be you know, a thing that happens to be saved in a lot of different ways. So for example, at, when we get out into the tribulation period, the, the, the uh, 70th week of Daniel... Uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, something that's a part of the prophetic scriptures, right? That's concerning Israel's future, right? During that time, people will be able to call out to God to be saved, but saved from what to what? That's a very important question. Do you know that right now as a believer, you can call on God to save you, but from what to what? And what will be the result? That's another biggie. You know, I, I may have an ailment that is driving me bananas. Let's say I'm just like the Apostle Paul and was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, he says. And there's this person that's driving me nuts. And I call out to God, God save me. Just like Paul did three times. What was the answer? God said, my grace is sufficient. Did God answer the prayer? Absolutely. Was it always for the good? Absolutely. But it's the good according to God's definition, remember? Always. And so we have to be careful and very precise in this stuff. We've got to understand, because the moment you say this to somebody, you have to call on Jesus physically or make a verbal confession, which is the argument that's made. The moment you do that, you have now mingled works with faith. And so what happens if the person doesn't make the verbal confession? Let's say somebody has a real serious, real serious anxiety about standing in front of people and speaking in public. You know what? They're doomed to hell. Let, well, let's say they're mute. They can't talk. They sign in public. It's not what the Bible says. It says with the mouth. It doesn't say with the fingers confession is made. <laughs> yeah. Do like one of those little, you know, where they paint the lips right there and they kind of, I don't know how you do that. But anyway, uh, it's not the same thing. You, you see where you've got to be precise. You've got to be careful about this stuff. Um, what we're all after here is justification. We want to be good enough to God. We, we want God to accept us. Well, God has made very clear in His Word that for us to be accepted in the beloved, to be made the righteousness of God, we have to be in Christ. And the way we are in Christ is by a simple belief, a simple belief in His work. Now, works that follow that are to a different end, for a different purpose. 
Okay? And so it's very important that we sort of understand that. Um, now, Emma, you brought this up earlier. So I, I, this is a point I want to be uber, uber clear. All right? Because we're not the only ones listening. Y'all, we are so important at Liberty Bible Church. We are, we are so awesome. We have people all over this world watching us on YouTube. That's true, Cotton. They hear your name in England. I've had, I've had messages from people in Australia asking me, who's this Rita person? Can you turn the camera around? I've had questions about, what, can we meet Truman? And, you know, so I've protected y'all. You're welcome. You're welcome. I am the face of this church, and we just need to keep it. This, this is bad news, y'all. This is bad news. But we got people listening, and here's the reality. I have no clue who will happen upon this message. So let me take a moment to be super duper crystal clear for just a second. Today, under the dispensation of grace, and what I mean by that, we are under today what we call a policy system known as grace, different than the policy system of the Mosaic Law. We are today under a system known as grace. Now, under the dispensation of grace, which started at the Apostle Paul's conversion. We know that from 1 Timothy chapter 1. Okay? This dispensation which started at the Apostle Paul's conversion and is outlined by the terms of the revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul. Okay? Here's what it states. The only requirement for full, absolute, guaranteed righteousness that gives a person an eternal home in heaven that can never be taken away is trust in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. Not any of your work, not any of your relatives' work can make up that for you. It is a belief in His work alone. It is faith Plus nothing. Now, how do I know that? Because it's not just my word you have to go on. Y'all know this. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. This is just a springboard I like to, to use to explain this, if you will. Romans chapter 1. Paul writes in Romans 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed... Of the what? The gospel of Christ. That is the good news of Christ. For it, it being the gospel or the good news of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that does what? Believe. Believeth. There's nothing else other than the believeth thing, Right? Uh, once you believeth the gospel of Christ, God's power is effective to save you at that moment. So the golden question then becomes, what is the gospel of Christ? If it is that important, we need to know what the gospel of Christ is because it alone is the thing that can give us eternal security and that gives us that home in heaven one day. And so, where is it? Where do we find the gospel of Christ? Anna? Emma? <laughs> I'm tired. The Diet Coke hasn't really kicked in yet. Emma? 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Alright, go to 1 Corinthians chapter... I don't... Where did I come up with Anna? That was random. Alright, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Alright, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Again, Paul says it very clearly. He says he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth. So this is the God. We're about to read the gospel of Christ that we're supposed to believe in, put our trust in, okay, so that we can be saved. Here it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Notice what Paul says. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you 
the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have what? Received. This is what I'm asking you to do right now. And this is for the person that may be tuning in on YouTube. Maybe this is the first time it's ever been explained to them. And this is what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you when you hear what we're about to read, that you'll receive it as the truth. I'm asking you that you'll receive it as the work that is good enough to save you. That's what I'm asking. Will you do that? Well, let's keep reading. Paul writes, by which also ye are saved. And he says, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, he's talking about calling to remembrance there, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that, here it is, here it is, the plain and simple gospel of Christ. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now let me ask you a very simple question. Where in those verses does it say you need to pray to make Him the Lord of your life? Where in those verses does it command you to confess your sins to be saved? Where in those verses does it command you to be water baptized to be saved? Where in those verses does it command you to give so that you can be saved? Where in those verses does it command you to go through the sacraments to be saved? Where in those verses does it command you to teach or to go on missions or to be a deacon or a Sunday school teacher or any of those things? Where does it command that? It's not there. You know why? Because this verse, these verses are not talking about your work. And you know why? Because your work cannot save you. You are a fallen being. You've got to have His help. So here's the beautiful news. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul tells us, but God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, that God, he, it is our faith that justifieth the ungodly. I mean, this is wonderful news for us. Christ died for the ungodly. That's all of us. So I'm asking you, will you receive that as the truth? That's what will save you. Now let's move forward. Come back with me to Romans chapter 10. Again, I want to make a, just a quick personal note here because trust me when I tell you, this is still fresh for me. And when I say this, I mean accepting this notion not only of right division, but everything that sort of reigns out of it. Because it's a lot. It rewrites everything you were taught to believe, okay? So, I, I, I know how radical, I know how heretical it sounds. Trust me, I get that. Um, how scary it can be to, to follow this kind of biblical interpretation. But ultimately, we, we, we must each individually, because this is such an individual thing, answer to God and what His Word says. And what does His Word say? Come with me to uh, Romans chapter 14, uh, verse 5. Sorry, I, I told you to go back to Romans 10. Come to Romans chapter 14, verse 5. Again, this is an individual thing. It's something you have to answer for, that you have to be convinced of. Romans chapter 14 and uh, verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Now here it is. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I'm going to say something that no preacher on planet earth has ever said from the pulpit. Are y'all ready for this? Because I am aware that this could dwindle my congregation. If you don't agree with right division, you don't have to sit here and listen to it. You don't. 
In fact, I'd encourage you to do this. Take time on your own. to Sit down with the Word, the Word alone. Read it for yourself and see if you come to the same conclusion. Here's what I trust. I don't trust me. I don't trust you. I don't trust John Calvin. I don't trust Arminius. I don't trust MacArthur. I don't trust fill in the blank, Billy Graham. I, I don't trust any person. What I do trust is that the Holy Spirit coupled with His Word will get the job done. If at the end of that, you don't have that agreement, I understand. That's scary, isn't it? I trust, though, that if you do that, you're going to find this issue of right division is so awesome. <laughs> it is so liberating. It is the most joy-giving thing. And it, it, even, it even turns your worst moments in your religious life to happy times because you, you'll actually wear it as a badge of honor. Like, yeah, we got kicked out of the church. <laughs> How many of us have that testimony, right? And so it is a wonderful fellowship to be a part of. Now, this leaves us with, with one really important question. To what level... This is a big deal. And I don't care what church you go to, this is a question you got to answer for yourself and be fully persuaded in. To what level are you willing to live by the words of truth in the Bible? How fully are you willing to let that thing inform your decisions? Your church life, your personal life, your, your work life. All the, your relationships, how you handle your money, how you, you know, handle your spouse. I, I mean, it, it, it's how, to what level are you willing to live by the words of truth in the Bible? Now, watch this. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Again, as a, a just a personal testimony. I was sitting in my office at New Bethel Baptist Church, Tuscumbia, Alabama. This has been, my goodness, it has been about nine years ago now. Nine years ago. I had heard this thing, Right Division, at this point. This was in the winter of 2015. I will never forget it because I was struggling mightily. And that doggone Truman Johnson. <laughs> and... Uh, I was considering this stuff of right division. I was sitting down in my office just trying to look at the Bible and just understand it for myself. And I had a moment where I had a decision to make. Do I go all in or don't I? Is this right or isn't it? And, and, and when you have these kind of moments, like, this is like crossroads kind of stuff. I mean, you go to the, you know, if you go to the left, you're doomed. <laughs> if you go to the right, you feel doomed, right? And it's just like, what do I do? And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, look with me at verse 15. And I'd advise everybody to do this. Meditate upon these things, but this part right here got me. Go in halfway. What does it say? Holy, not H O L Y, but W H O L L Y. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Um, 
there was another moment in my ministry. I uh, I had come to the place where I was as a full time vocational pastor trying to determine whether or not I just keep fighting. If I stay in the denominational model and work from within that and try to be, I guess you could say, a reformer. <laughs> uh, that's kind of funny. Um, do I try to do my best to just keep duking it out? Do I just kill the thing? <laughs> really, that's what was happening. I was killing a church. Or do, what do I do? And that doggone verse there, I couldn't escape it anymore. And the Lord said, Greg, give yourself holy. And here we are. Here we are. Um, it is amazing when you choose to just trust God's Word and you take it for what it says and, you, and you're intentional about it. Um, God has just this wonderful way of, of working in those situations and doing some amazing things. Y'all, I look in this room right now. Um, this truly is amazing. Now that I think about it. Rovlin, Miss Mildred, and Cotton. Y'all are some OGs. Cotton, I think you and Miss Mildred, if I'm not mistaken, Rovlin, I don't, I can't remember not because it's been so long ago now. I think y'all were at that very first Saturday meeting we had over here <coughs> across the street. I mean, y'all, so look at this room. Where did y'all come from? Where'd y'all come from? <laughs> what brought you here? What what happened? It, would you be? Would we be having this biblical fellowship if I had not just given myself wholly to it? I don't. Would y'all have come to New Bethel Baptist Church to hear this stuff? It took us having the gazebo, right? We had to have the gazebo. We had to get out of the church thing, right? And that's not a knock. That's praise the Lord. <laughs> I needed that too, Brian. I got to tell you this: um, you are the singular person that finally gave me the permission not to worry about dressing up for Sunday. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell, tell you what a beautiful thing that was. That helped me relax beyond anything that I could possibly imagine. And it was such a good thing because I remember when we were at the at Truman's, it's when we finally started moving up onto the driveway. I remember one Sunday you showed up in shorts with a button-up shirt untucked, and I think you had flip-flops on, and I thought, praise the Lord, because it was eight kajillion degrees out there, and I had blue jeans on with my shirt tucked in, and I was like, this something's got to give. That next Sunday I wore flip-flops. I did, and that's because you, and I praise God for that. Well, you're following Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I can get to wear sandals, right? That's the style. And so, um, yeah, I, I, like this is so huge. This is so important. And so, give yourself wholly to it. All right, got a few more minutes, and then we're going to take a break. And in, in, so, now back in Romans, Romans chapter ten. So, what's going on in this midsection of Romans? One of the lessons that we are are taught is to learn from Israel's failure. <clears throat> Okay, learn from Israel's failure. Israel has heard. They had preachers sent to them. They had heard. Uh, they had ample opportunity, and yet they rejected God. God, and so what happened? As God initiated change, Israel rejected it, and Israel denied the fulfillment of prophecy as it even happened in front of them. And so the result is that Israel just really missed out. And so God's plan has been to bless the world through Israel, but Israel's disobedience has lost them so much opportunity. Now what Paul is going to do is, is going to, to, he's going to go to the Gentiles, and in particular he's going to speak here to the body of Christ and say, hey guys, Israel had their opportunities, they rejected it. Don't you let the same thing come around and miss the boat. And that's where we come to now. In Romans 10, verse 15, he says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. So Paul's talking here to Gentiles about Israel in the past as the gospel came to them. Okay? They, they did not believe that. They did not obey the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? 
Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that saw me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gangsaying people. And so, in this passage, Paul is speaking again to the body of Christ, the Gentiles, and he's prodding us. He's prodding us to not forsake the opportunity to preach. Okay? Don't forsake the opportunity to preach because he's also informing his hearers that Israel has heard their gospel but has rejected it, um, even though it was, it was clearly prophesied. Um, I want you to remember this. Really important. Paul is talking about what has changed with this new dispensation. And so as we're coming through the book of Romans, Paul is laying down all this foundational stuff concerning the dispensation of the grace of God. And this is all because of what God revealed to him through the mystery, right? And so Paul is talking about what has changed. And so one major aspect of this dispensation of grace is that Israel is, is currently hardened against Christ. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And so they don't accept Him on top of that. Okay? They are rejecting prophecy which clearly taught that God was going to use another group to make Israel jealous. So right now, Jews are rejecting prophecy, which is really interesting to me because so many of them work so hard to study it. And they're not seeing that very clearly God said, at some point, I'm going to use a group of people to make you turn. And they're still rejecting it. Okay, and so now we know because of the, the revelation of the mystery given to Paul that the body of Christ is the people that Paul is identifying using prophecy here. Now the world back then didn't know anything about this body of Christ issue because that was hidden God, right? That's part of the mystery. Now we know that because of the Apostle Paul. And so the body of Christ today, this is what I want to draw down to here now, what we're getting to as we move to chapter 11 in the second half day. The body of Christ is now the apple of God's eye. Remember that. When we come back after the break, we're going to dig into that just a little bit further, and then we'll go on. All right, let's break and get some coffee. <laughs> Kayla's not need coffee. <laughs>